What is up, everybody? This is Chase, and welcome back to the Wellness Center podcast, where we are destigmatizing mental health one episode at a time. Everyone, thank you so much for joining me today. I hope everyone is having a wonderful end to their summer, the start of the school season for those people in the school, you know, in the realm of school, right? Life is busy. Life is bustling. I hope everyone's having a great time and a great experience. I know that I'm having a lot of fun now. We just sent my son to school like a couple of weeks ago, and he's been really enjoying that time. He's five. Um, and, you know, it's kind of cool. We went to we did public school last year and we put him in a private school this year. And just the difference in his desire to be in school is like super fun for us as parents. So that's just a little something about my life. Um, everyone, super excited for my guest today. This lady is not only like super vulnerable with her story, so much so that she made a short story that she's going to, we're going to talk about a little bit later, but this lady's an absolute rock star. So like, I am super, super pumped to celebrate her today. So everyone, as we are getting ready to celebrate this awesome guest, I have a couple of things I just want to mention, guys. If you're not a part of the Wellness Center Tribe, please make sure to like and subscribe, right? Do that, hit, smash that subscribe button. If you're on like Apple or Spotify, please make sure to hit that follow and download button so you can get updated on like all the episodes that we're releasing. We do that on a weekly basis, right? I want to give you the schools, the, the skills and tools that you can use over the weekend just to cope, find help, do all of those wonderful things, right? Um... So that's my big thing, guys. Our, my goal is 500 subscribers. We're currently at 213 on YouTube. So we're getting closer. We're getting there. And then my goal is 10 five-star reviews combined on Apple and Spotify. We're currently at about five. So we're just, we're making our way there, guys. So if you, if you haven't already, share it with a friend or family member. Let everyone know about the show. Tell them how awesome me and my guests are. And just help us grow this tribe because all of this is free. It's just a service I want to provide to help people. So guys, without further ado, I want to bring on my amazing guest. I'm really excited about her. So guys, my guest is a transformational coach and professional storyteller. She is a speaker and a filmmaker. She's the creator of Shucking, which is her version of life coaching. She overcame grit of an abusive home, a traumatic brain injury, and is now caring for a partner with stage four cancer. She also has a master's degree in spiritual psychology and advocate for healing through yoga, meditation, and the Hoffman process. And she is also very soon going to release her new short film called Cracked. And we're super excited to talk about that all today. So without further ado, we have Jessica on the show. Jessica, how are you doing today? It's going to be a fine day today. I am so excited to be here. Chase, thank you for having me and for all the light you are spreading in this world. I just uh, love all your messages and everything you're doing. So thank you. Hey, thank you so much. You know, I there are too many people in the world, in my opinion, that suffer with too many things that don't talk about it. So I just wanted to create a platform where we can talk about it, right? And, and have no shame either, because there's no shame in being a human. That's right. Yeah, I love it. So Jessica, can you just tell me and the viewers a little bit about you so we can get to know you a little bit better? Yeah, you know, um, specific to the mental health journey, I grew up with a father that was diagnosed with schizophrenia mm -hmm. and it created a pretty violent environment. And my mom broke us free when I was about seven or eight years old. And so then there was about 25 years where... I didn't have him in my life. And mm -hmm. at that point is when I really dug into my spirituality, my growth, my healing with all sorts of modalities mm -hmm. and got to reconcile with him. And it was absolutely one of the best things I could have done. And we can dive into that a little bit more, but it's been a journey. I, you know, I, I really, um, I really had a lot of belief systems that were holding me back and limiting me. You know, I thought I caused the schizophrenia. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I had to deal with abandonment issues. I have had to work on trust issues, all, all of these things. So mm -hmm. for anyone who's listening, like you're not alone, you know, your story is unique to you for sure. Um, but there are so many of us out here that have gone through some grit and, 
you can also get to the other side too. So I can't even wait to get into that with you, Chase, but that's a little bit, but on the other side, on the more fun side, I, I love traveling and I, uh, you know, I've traveled around the world often solo. I've biked across South Africa, you know, so I've done a lot of fun things too, and, um, haven't let any of that trauma hold me back too much. Um, but it's definitely created a lot of work in my life though, too. Yeah. So that's super cool about the travel, uh, the traveling that you're doing, right? Like, yeah. um, I know that like in your intro stuff, you said that you got a concussion in Nepal. Yeah, I was um, hiking in in the mountains there and I actually had um, cerebral edema and so it's brain swelling and got helicoptered off the mountain and they took me into um, Kathmandu, I think it was. And um, yeah, so I was in the ER and they took great care of me. And um, there's some funny stories like I tried breaking out of the hospital because my brain just wasn't working. And, and I succeeded. There we go. So the security guard, I had the nurses pull out all my IVs and um, I checked into the, the best hotel I could find. And my favorite story from that is um, when I checked in, there was a buffet. And because I'd been hiking in the mountains for, at that point, it had been like 11 or 12 days, um, I was hungry. And so I had 11 plates of food the whole staff was like looking at me like what is this little person doing eating 11 plates of food I just like I was like a you know a football linebacker just um, getting ready for a game or something it was it was pretty funny but on the serious side the the brain swelling was dangerous and I was lucky to have um, a good team around me that got me the help I needed and mm -hmm. Yeah. Did and you, I survived. Here I am. Did you somehow get back to the hospital or did all that food like fix the inflammation? Well, no, I did not get back to the hospital, though I should have. I got pretty lucky that, mm -hmm. um, but well, I ended up sleeping in the ho uh, hotel for a number of days, just kind of slept it off and mm -hmm. hydrated and all of that. And I, I was talking to my doctor here in the US as mm -hmm. well. And so waited until it was safe to fly home, or at least that we thought it was. But but yeah, it would have been smarter to stay in the hospital, but it was, it was weird because only a few people actually spoke English. So they were like poking me and prodding me and putting, um, asking me to take medicine that I didn't really know what it was for. So not only was my brain not working fully, but also it was just in a foreign country. So there's lots of parts to the story, but overall I'm safe. And now I only hike to, you know, maybe 10 or 12,000 feet <laughs> instead of the higher altitude. That is absolutely crazy. Holy cow. Thank you for sharing. That's, that's such yeah. a unique and cool story. I mean, like two truths and a lie. I bet you're ready to go with that one. <laughs> I've got a lot of good ones. <laughs> <laughs> and just kind of for, for those people that are in Utah, like there's something common here. Uh, Jessica, it, she loves Powder Mountain, right? She loves skiing up at Powder Mountain. She says she goes up there every year, which is, again, one of the most beautiful mountains there are. So magical. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and also uh, kind of back to your intro a little here. I know you talked about like the Hoffman method. Hoffman method? Is that like the Wim Hofing method of like cold plunging and breathing or? It's actually different. So Wim Hof is amazing too. I think that is a great modality for many people for a variety of reasons, but mm -hmm. the Hoffman process was at the time I went, it was an eight day retreat and mm -hmm. you turn off all connection to the world and really dive into what your belief systems are. And this was really the first time I was introduced to this concept that I had learned all these things from parents or role models or teachers or whatever. And so I spent that entire week learning, okay, what kind of programming have I adopted through my life? And mm -hmm. which of that programming is actually helping me? Which of it's hurting me? And so they really gave me the tools to understand that it was learned. And the cool thing about when something's learned, you can unlearn it. So if it wasn't working for me, why was I going to use that belief system? And so I walked out of there completely floating and liberated because I had never experienced anything like that. I was like, wait, I'm not wrong. I'm not broken. These are just things I've learned. And so 
it was such a pivotal time and really a catalyst for so many more things I've done since then. But it, I, I highly recommend it to anyone that can, you know, carve out that kind of time. They actually have scholarships too. So if financial um, situation is a concern, they, they, they're an amazing organization. So it's called the Hoffman process. The Hoffman process. Okay. Super cool. Yeah. And I love that you talked about learned traits, right? And I think that leads and segues perfectly into my first question. Yeah. So, Jessica, I want you to take us back to a young Jessica. What were some of the first times that you struggled with your mental health? Oh, it, you know, I can't really necessarily say the age, but I can tell you some of the things that I experienced. And one that was prevalent in my life was this inner conflict of loving my father while also fearing him. Mm -hmm. And that created so much confusion because I didn't really understand. I, you know, I didn't have another father mm -hmm. and I didn't know what he was doing was, um, you know, not, not healthy or not right. Like instinctively I was protecting myself and my mom was protecting me and everything like that. But, but there's this confusion and that, I mean, that's hard to navigate as an eight-year-old, a nine-year-old, and, and then bringing that into later years. And other parts of that chase were the guilt. My father at times would blame me for some of his behaviors. And I now have the hindsight to know that, that, that you know, his behaviors are his responsibility. But when you're a child, I didn't know that it wasn't my fault. And so I had this tremendous weight on my shoulders that I was the one hurting everybody in my family. Mm -hmm. And that led me to being a caregiver and overcompensating in so many facets of my life. And um, the other thing that I adopted in that kind of environment is really trying to be a perfectionist because the way my dad's um, behavior exhibited itself is it was just explosive and disruptive at unexpected times. Like he was the most charming and charismatic and fun loving father on one side. And then all of a sudden his eyes would be beady red and like rage was just coming out of him. And, and so again, kind of tying it back to that idea that I felt like I caused it. I tried to like make sure everything was perfect. And I tried to stay within the lines because I felt like if I, if I somehow did something wrong, that was going to trigger him. You know, sometimes um, if I put the toothpaste cap on in the wrong way, like that would um, create an event. Or if I didn't um, eat my vegetables, you know, he would shove them down my throat until I would throw up and, like it was just um, confusing, and and at, at that age, I had no idea that I had done nothing wrong, and so I just felt like I was broken for most of my life. And what that did is it really put me inside of a shell, and 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 living inside the shell, it was lonely because I didn't really want to let anybody in. I had a lot of people around me. I, you know, I was able to put these masks on of like, Hey, everything's okay. Even my best of friends when I was younger had no idea what I was going through. And, and that was by design. Um, I probably could have won an Emmy. Um, is that what it is? An Emmy? Yeah. I could have won an Emmy with all my acting, but, um, uh, but yeah, but it really led to being super lonely and um, unsatisfying and and empty. And yeah, and so there were times that I used drugs as an outlet. Um, I was fortunate to not really go down a super dark path with that, um, but I definitely used it as an escape mechanism for a while. Mm -hmm. And um, other destructive behaviors like um, I really was trying to control my weight because, um, I felt like that was the one thing I could control in my life. It's like, okay, I here, let's, let's do this. If, it, um, 
if I can control something, it felt almost like safe, if, if you will. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then what I've also learned, Chase, is I would attract in partners that shared characteristics of my father. And so my first real boyfriend in high school, he had a diagnosis of bipolar at the time. And navigating that as a 17 year old is, is hard because here's this person that's just this amazing soul who's going through something pretty challenging. And I don't have the knowledge or the wisdom or the tools to help him or, or myself. And um, yeah, so there was just a lot of layers that were created from that environment. Mm -hmm. And not that I blame him. Right. Um, it's, I, I don't feel like I'm a victim to it anymore, but for the longest time I did. Yeah, and um, yeah, and that was part of the healing that I think we're going to get into a little bit as moving from that victim mindset to one of more empowerment and growth. Yeah, I, I love that. And, and thank you for sharing your, kind of your story there and, and being open and willing to talk about some of those hard moments you had as a kid and mm -hmm. you know, the relationships and stuff. I'm curious, did the kind of the abusive tendencies that your father exhibited, were those, did they start around that seven or eight year old age? Or was that some of the first times that you were just kind of aware that it wasn't right? Yeah, great question. Um, so his journey with schizophrenia um, I have been able to dig into some of my grandmother's journals and she started noticing some things around five or six that he was acting a little bit differently than other kids, his age. And, um, and then it started to get worse in his late teens. And so it was always there for my life. Um, but I also didn't know any different. So that's just who I knew him to be. And we had a lot of great neighbors that would take me in, um, and protect me at, in some of the harder times. Um, I also had a closet that I would, um, retreat to. So I wasn't exposed to, um, I could have been exposed more if, if that makes sense. Um, yeah. I don't want to like necessarily say it was a lot or a little just because it's such a hard thing to, um, it was your experience with it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But, um, but yeah. And then, and then once he was out of the home, mm -hmm. the, uh, the experience changed into more of like, um, a stalking and a terrorizing in that way. So he would like show up at my school unexpectedly. And I was lucky to have great leaders at the school that um, built systems to protect me. So if my father was found on campus, they would do a code red. And um, that meant I have to, I'd have to like go into the principal's office and get into a place of safety and, or find a teacher or something. And, um, not ideal, right? As a kid, you, it, it, um, it's embarrassing and scary and I didn't want anybody to know really what was going on, but I was lucky that the school system, uh, was able to have some of those systems in place to protect me and help me. So, um, yeah. So I don't know if that answers it in. Yeah, no, that's great. Thank you. Was there ever a time in your life where your dad stopped kind of that stalking tendencies like when you backed away from it? It was, you know, it was unpredictable. So there would be times where there'd be an entire year where he was very focused on um, connecting with us. Mm -hmm. And then he would disappear for six months or a year. So we never knew when the next event would happen. So it, it really felt like it was happening daily because my, my framework was that it was, it could happen. Right. So I always was looking over my shoulder and my fight or flight instincts were always elevated because I never knew when something would happen. Um, 
one little thing that still is true today. And here I am, my father is, has now died. So he's not, he's not even a threat. And he actually ended up being a little bit more mellow in his later years. But even to this day, I need to check in with my mom and make sure she's okay. Like yeah. it's such a deeply ingrained behavior that um, I'm working on unwinding, but, um, but it's just part of it, making sure that everyone in the family is safe. Yeah. And deep yeah. trauma takes time. Yeah, it absolutely. Does. Do it feel, sure does. Do you feel like the trauma that your father caused you and your family created really tight enmeshed connections between you and your mom? It it did. Um, which is beautiful, but also comes with complications, right? Because it's hard for somebody to come into the family when there's that kind of um, some people might label it a trauma bond or um, I just call it deep love because we are all so protective of each other and loving. And the woman is incredible. My mom, mm -hmm. I mean, like to have gone through that with me and then to really support me being my own person, like I can't even imagine like what it took for her to see this daughter like traveling around the world solo, right? Like, yeah. I mean, <laughs> to be that protective of me, I mean, she is amazing. She's like so fiercely loving and uh, she's just like a, the best gift. And like, I just have so much gratitude for her because it would have been easy for her to like try to constrain me and keep me close, but uh -huh. she's been my biggest supporter of, um, you know, growing into who I am, which yeah, is amazing. Um, yeah, that's phenomenal. Yeah. I kind of have one one big question that keeps coming to mind too. Like, yeah. With your father and his schizophrenia, did he kind of focus a lot of his abusive tendencies on you specifically? Or was it you, your mom, any siblings? Was it everyone or... Because I know, yeah. because I know you well, had mentioned like he blamed you for a lot of the ways that he behaved. Yeah, so I try to let let my family share their stories um, gotcha. for themselves. And my guess, though, is we'd all have our like our own interpretation. Like I, as a child, adopted the idea that it was my fault, but maybe everybody in the whole family thought that at one time. I haven't actually asked um but he he um yeah he was disruptive to everyone around him um even his siblings um they many of them cut him out just because of his behavior too so that makes sense yeah yep that makes sense it's cool okay so you to kind of continue on with the story you you know, you, you get separated, you kind of grow up. And I know you talked about it a little bit, but I'm really curious about like, at what point did you realize that you had to start doing these hard things and you started your heroine's journey? So please like describe for us, Jessica, and this is my second question, right? Your heroine's journey, this extreme moment, this pivotal trial, this thing that you had to undertake to become better. So it, it was um, at this time, um, I was living in Chicago and everything around me was falling apart. So the relationship I was in, I was supposed to get married. Mm -hmm. This um, job I had been working with, I got fired from it. Um, the relationship fell apart. I got fired. Um, the markets crashed. So I lost any, most of my savings. Like everything that I thought was... Um, real in my life or like the structure of my life just kind of evaporated and it was pretty disruptive and disturbing and this had nothing to do with my father and mm -hmm. everything to do about me and so instead of like jumping into another job I decided I wanted to go and like like fill my soul I had always wanted to do the Peace Corps and I never did so I went and volunteered in the Philippines and what I realized is that I had gone over there thinking that, you know, my partner, he was the wrong person because 
he lied and he cheated and whatever, all the things he did. And I thought the people I was working with in the startup, they were the scoundrels because I, I watched them, you know, do some things and, you know, it was so funny. So I always was pointing my finger out um, to everyone and everything around me. And while there might've been some truth to that, like if somebody cheats on you, they cheat on you. Like that's, that's just the situation. But when I got to the Philippines and I had a couple months just by myself, I realized, wait a minute, I still don't feel great. And Mm -hmm. that was the first moment I realized I was like, wait, I'm, I'm the common denominator here. Like I keep attracting in these types of people and like, what am I doing that's creating this? And that was like the first time I really had a sense of empowerment because that realization actually means to me now that I can do something about it. At that time, I was like, oh gosh, I'm broken. I'm, you know, I'm living life wrong. Look at all these things that I'm doing. But now I was like, oh, that was the moment I realized I was like, okay, wherever I go, there I am. I think that's like a book and maybe a favorite quote of people's. And I finally understood that what that meant. And so it was at that point, I finally started taking ownership of my life. Mm-hmm. Now, th- that being said, I had no idea what to do or where to go with that ownership because I had not been introduced to spirituality or healing modalities such as meditation or Mm -hmm. sound healing or whatever you name it so um yeah so then I was like well now what do I do (laughs) now that I (laughs) now that I know I've got to work on me like what does that look like and how do I do that and um I found my way to yoga and that was the first modality that really helped me because what ha- one of the things that happened in in my life with having my father be so angry i started to try to su- like suffocate my emotions just because i was worried that i might have schizophrenia i look at schizophrenia differently now i i don't fear it like i used to um mm-hmm. we can talk about that in at, at, at another point but um at that point i was afraid of it and so Like I would deny my feelings because I felt like if I had any feelings, that meant I was going to be sick like my dad. Mm -hmm. And it was yoga where I learned that emotions are natural and that emotions are healthy. And there's really healthy ways we can deal with emotions. And they're actually a compass for us. If we are feeling angry, something needs to change. If we're feeling resentful, something needs to change. So it was at that point that things really started to open up for me because I was like, well, like I can actually be happy and sad. Like, um, this is amazing. (laughs) I might not like the sad feelings, but like, um, yeah. And then, and then these other modalities chase just started to show up for me. And I believe this, um, there's this, um, idea that when the student is ready, the teacher appears Mm -hmm. and I just kept having these angels like show up in my life and like guide me to where I needed to go next for my own healing. And it's, it's been remarkable. That's amazing. Congratulations. What a, what an amazing journey for you, right? To go from something so awful, right, as having uh, the father with his schizophrenia to finding all these modalities that have just helped you thrive. I think that's so beautiful. So congratulations to you, Jessica. I'm curious about your um, working in the Peace Corps. What were you doing out in the Philippines? I was working with um, street kids, uh, informal oh. education. And so we just really just kind of hung out all day, every day together. <laughs> that sounds like a lot. There of was fun. a language barrier. They they spoke Tagalog and I didn't. And uh, so we would just have dance parties and I just got to love them. And it was it was special. And, and I mean, like, what a great opportunity for you to be that loving parent figure, right? Like, that's, that's so super cool. 
And, and I'm really curious, like with your yoga, is there, is there any specialty in the trauma, like trauma informed yoga or anything like that, that you, that you specialize in? Great question. I, I've never even heard of it um, referenced that way. I've just always just done vinyasa and cool. wherever I live, I look for a teacher that aligns with me. And yeah. Um, yeah, so anybody that's just diving into yoga, there's all these different types and each teacher is really unique as well. So if the first class you go to doesn't feel great, it doesn't mean yoga is not not going to be great. Um, it might mean that, but like give a couple other teachers tries right. and, um, you might find the magic too. And if not, there's so many other things to do as well. That, yeah. So that's so true. And yeah, so the reason I asked about the trauma informed is my wife is actually a trauma informed yoga teacher. She oh, was wow. like super specific training that helps her help people who've experienced specific women who have experienced like trauma and wow. it helps them get in tune with their bodies and reconnected to their bodies. And it, it helps them feel just like what you were talking about. So a lot mm -hmm. of what you were mentioning was like, oh, that sounds a lot like trauma-informed yoga. So I'll have to get you two connected yeah. after the episode today so she can like give you some more info with that if you'd be interested. But no. And how does anybody watching this find her? What, what, how can they search for her? Yeah, great question. So um, she mainly teaches at a therapeutic practice called Love Strong, lovestrong.com. Uh, just look for Keela Warburton and she, yeah, she's their trauma informed yoga teacher. Um, yeah. We'll put the link in the, in the description, but no, cool. So Jessica, you start developing all of these different modal, like the yoga and the meditation, right. And all these things, what, and this kind of leads again, perfectly into my next question. What were some of the skills that you developed early on? How were they practiced early on and how have they evolved up to this point in your life? Yes. Yeah, so, so many gifts from all of this. And I would say empathy is one of them. Mm -hmm. And just because of going through so much grit and getting to see behind the scenes and behind the curtain, it allows me to relate to other people in, in a loving way. It does, I'm, I'm still human. I still get have my judgments and bad days and stuff, but, but overarching I have a lot of empathy and and really have this ability to sense what's going on and whether that was developed because of the environment or a gift I was born with I'm not sure but um I believe it's probably a combination so that's been such a beautiful gift to have I I also really have grown to be super curious which has put me on this path of learning and discovery. And not that I have to have the answers. I used to want to have the answers before, but um, but I've also had to let go that I might not get the answers. Um, mm -hmm. You know, with my dad passing away last year, you know, so many things have been left unsaid and coming to terms with that is, is a process for me. But but also it just allows me to learn more. Like I get to read books and take workshops and um, and ask people really what, what, what sparks them and why they're doing the things they are. And I can't even have a surface level conversation anymore. I get so bored. Like um, I, like, I really want to know like what, what, um, what life, uh, why life's so important to somebody and what sparks them. So those are some of the gifts. I also am fabulous in crisis. Like you want me on your team if anything wild is going on with your life, with your business or whatever, because I had a lot of practice of being in um, chaos, if you will. Now I'm terrible with customer service. Like I, I am, I'm absolutely terrible there. So if somebody can help me out with customer service, I can help you out with crisis because it is one of my superpowers. Um, and then I've also really developed a, um, a strong inner world. And it didn't start out intentional because I think as a child, I just went in to escape from everything that was going on. But, but now it's such a beautiful experience to have that in life, to know that I'm okay, just, you know, 
sitting and being, I, I can, I do these um, eight day silent retreats by myself and they're, they're not easy um, for me, but also just this like really beautiful, rich relationship I have inside of me, uh, I think has been developed because of all of this. So, um, and now because of all the healing I've done, now I get to help the world and give back and service to me is, is why we're all here. And service looks different from each person based on the gifts we've been given. But when I get to connect with somebody and help them see that there is a different possibility um, and show them how to bridge that, like that is just like the like most delicious thing in the world to help others. So, so those are some of the gifts. Um, I'm also pretty fearless because mm -hmm. I feel like if I, if I feared being in my home, going out into the world, that was easy. So like all this solo travel, I, of course I'm safe. I have my, you know, I trust my instincts. I have, you know, things I do like befriend the hotel staff and stuff like that. But, mm -hmm. but really like, it's been so fun to travel the world and experience it. And um, I don't know if I could have done that if I had such a safe home in the beginning that I never wanted to leave. So yeah. I just like had this benefit and gift and uh, it's, it's created some really unique experiences. So I'm so very cool. grateful for that. That's cool. So I'm, I'm really curious about, so the next thing here, I know what, whatever you're going to share is about to be super phenomenal. <laughs> right, we're all about using hands-on, like teaching hands-on skills on the podcast. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, what are some hands-on skills that people can use to practice empathy, curiosity, and working through fear, right? Because I noticed those were kind of a bit, those kind of the big points you talked about. First, I would say, give yourself permission. Okay. So many of us have been taught, whether through society or well-intentioned parents that were maybe a little misguided or things like that, that um, we were not, our feelings aren't valid or our instincts are off. So for example, um, I was with my niece the other day and she's, she's so in tune and, and she's younger, she's in her teens. And she asked, you know, Jesse, are you mad at me? And and I was, you know, my instinct was, no, I'm not mad at you. Like, because I wasn't, but what I was feeling was I was feeling upset because I was still in grief with my father um, mm -hmm. dying. And, you know, there's some people in the world that may believe like, we don't want to, you know, the younger person to have to worry about the grief or whatever. And, and I definitely wanted to protect her in ways but I also wanted to validate her feelings. And so the way I approached it with her was, you know what, you're right. You're sensing something off. Let me tell you what's really going on because I want her to develop that strength, that trust that she was sensing something. She's like spot on. And that way, when she's out in the world with other people, like she, you know, has those skills. And so if somebody's 70 and they haven't had that gift of somebody really validating their feelings or affirming, mm -hmm. um, I think it starts with ourselves, giving ourselves permission to be, to believe we have these gifts and, and then you can just journal and practice and take notes and say, okay, what am I noticing today? Mm -hmm. What am I sensing? What am I feeling? What, what kind of energy is, is, am I aware of right now? So, so that would be one way to develop empathy. I think, um, I'm sure there's a lot of other ways, but well, I think that's, I think that's a really good way to develop it because I also feel like it's developing curiosity because those questions that you asked are kind of open-ended. They're making you think about like, man, what is going on? What's around me? What's in me? What am I feeling? What are they, what do I think they are feeling? Right. It's, I know. I think that's awesome. Yeah. And with curiosity, one thing that I teach my clients is you've got to say at least six other possibilities 
before you draw a conclusion. So, so frequently mm -hmm. we'll draw a conclusion about some yeah, situation, right? Yeah. So you, you call me and you say, oh, I've got to cancel our meeting. And I'm like, mm -hmm. it's because he doesn't want to talk to me, you know, like, or whatever. And yeah. like, and you miss like what really is going on because we're so myopic, right? And right. I call it the me bias that we, we see the world through the way we experience it and how we would act. So I assume everybody is going to act the same way. Well, no, we all are so different. And so if we can remove that bias mm -hmm. and get curious and say, okay, what are other six possibilities? Okay. Oh, maybe school starting. And he actually wanted to be with his kids. Right. Mm -hmm. And, or maybe one of the kids got sick and needed some extra time, or maybe the technology is not working or, 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 you know, it's, mm -hmm um curiosity can come in so many ways and and i think curiosity leads to a deeper connection because it it allows us to really see and acknowledge the other person and i think that's i think at the end of the day that's what we all want and yeah. so so yeah so getting curious but then i think that also requires us to be vulnerable so when somebody's curious with us we've got to share openly as well. And, mm -hmm. and by modeling it, then other people will do it with us as well. So. Right. No, I think that's so ideas. cool. And it's so true. And I love that you pointed like, and I don't know if you did this intentionally, right? But when you talked about, hey, he, he's canceling, <gasps> he doesn't want to talk to me, right? Like typically the first response that people have is negative, right? And I see that a lot in my life that people, just kind of assume the worst about the world. And it's not like, it's more, in my opinion, a protective part of people just trying to keep themselves safe. But the minute you said, well, what are other things? The first thing was something generous, right? He just wants to be with his kids. Maybe technology isn't working, right? And that curiosity is what allows you to like, to find that generosity in people. And that creates a much more loving environment for everybody. Right. Because it's like, even if you just had those two going from the he doesn't want to talk to me, to oh, he just wants to be with his kids opens up so much more opportunity for great growth and understanding and stuff. So, no, I think that was, that's truly amazing. And the vulnerability is also a really important part. So thank you. And then so the the fear, how can people learn to embrace fear? Mm. Learning to embrace fear. That one, I want to offer this idea is we can live from a place of fear or we can live from a place of love. And it's in the awareness and the intentionality of our choices that can change the trajectory of our lives. And making choices from a place of fear isn't necessarily bad or wrong but it might block us from what we truly want. So for example, if somebody wants to quit their job and start working at the wellness center with you, right? Mm -hmm. um, fear might say, well, I'm not qualified enough. Mm -hmm. I don't have enough experience. I um, I'll never make any money really doing what I love. I'm like, all of that is fear-based thinking. Right. And like you said, there's like this, it's almost like a protective mechanism. I believe it comes from maybe the ego or something like that. And mm -hmm. by playing small, you're more contained and then potentially less things will happen to you. I think that's kind of an illusion. Things are going to happen. Life's going to happen no matter where you are. So you may as well be doing what you love, right? Right. And so love-based thinking is, I'm going to figure it out. Chase is an awesome person. He's going to help and mentor me. And there's classes I can take. And you know what? This is so important to me. I'm going to get a second job. So until I can actually make enough money being a healer, then, you know, it's, it's like, um, just becoming aware of where your thinking is coming from. And for me, Chase, journaling was the best tool for identifying that because I could slow down and really 
look at, oh, look at that. That's coming from a place of fear. The other thing is sometimes having somebody reflect back to you. Mm -hmm. I, you know, if, if you're blessed and you can have a life coach, great. Um, but sometimes it's just a coffee friend that mm -hmm. is willing to be honest with you and say, well, why are you thinking that way? Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes somebody else's perspective will really help open up the possibilities. So, um, and then I would unwind what the fear is. You can keep kind of going lower and where's the fear coming from so you can get to the root. Mm -hmm. And I feel like once we illuminate where the fear is coming from, it helps to dissolve it. Sometimes there's nothing to even do other than just give it a voice and and then it disappears. Uh, you know, one question that I ask myself quite often in like fear chasing and, and doing all these things is what part of me is feeling this fear? And I've learned that like when I ask that question, almost instantly the answer comes, right? Like, so for example, my wife and I just bought a new car and had to, I had to fly out to Los Angeles to get it. And it was in kind of a ghetto part of Reseda and like, all these things, I was having like so much anxiety over this. And then like, I finally took a step back and I was like, all right, what part of me is feeling this anxiety and fear right now? And it was, what came up to me was a past purchase my wife and I made that was pretty significant that kind of burned us. And it was years that we had to climb out of the debt from this experience. And okay. I was like, oh, okay. Now I know where this anxiety is coming from. And then I had to stop myself and I was like, all right, cool. Wait, Okay. I see the fear and I'm appreciative that it's trying to keep me safe. I've done my research. I know what I'm doing. I have a walk away, an exit strategy if I need to. And then instantly there was just peace. And it's like, okay, it's just crazy how cool and how quick that can be just by asking like simple questions. So for those listening, right? Like she just shared that, get curious, ask those questions and it will help. So Jessica, obviously you have found so much resilience in, in your life and you found so much happiness and peace. Looking back at your whole journey, all the stuff you had to go through, all the hard parts, what can you appreciate about the journey you've had to experience? Oh, so many things. I, I wouldn't be who I am. And uh, that is a quirky, uh, adventurous, nature-loving healer uh, that just loves life. I mean, I have my days and hard moments, but overall, like, I, I feel just radiant and um, I wouldn't have been able to get here if it wasn't for my life experiences. It's the metaphor that you referenced in the beginning. It's like the grit is actually what made my pearl and the pearl is me and I am sparkly and shiny be because of it. And I, once I realized that I was not the grit and the grit was just part of my life, mm -hmm. that changed everything. And so once I realized I'm not broken, there's nothing to fix. It's more about remembering how miraculous life is and that mm -hmm. all of us are worthy of this life and all of the abundance that we have. And um, yeah, so I'm just, I, I'm grateful. And listen, there's some hard days uh, and that's just going to be, be life, but, um, but yeah, I'm just grateful to be human. It's it's pretty uh, pretty miraculous and uh, wild. Yeah, that's so cool. Thank you for sharing. I, I think that that alone is going to inspire so much hope in the listen, in our listeners. So I, I think it's so important. So Jessica, my last question for you, and then I want to know a little bit more about like your coaching, what you consider shucking, yeah. and some of the stuff that you're doing now and yeah. So for those just getting into the realm of mental health, those just kind of asking that question or saying that statement of like, oh, shoot, I need help. Yeah. What advice do you have for those people? The first thing is it can be different. I didn't realize my life could be different. I, I was in the victim mindset and the victim modality and like living from that place. And what I mean by that is I felt like life was happening to me and I had no control of uh, changing my life in any way. And so my invitation to anyone who is in, in the grit right now, or just starting on this path is know that it can be different. And I also want to be careful to say 
this has taken me years to get here. I hope it's much faster for anybody listening, but I don't want to give anyone the false belief that this just happened overnight or that it was just a light switch that flicked on or off. Healing is it, it's a process, you know, it's been a journey and it's non-linear. Like some days I feel like this and then I might go back and forth and what, you know, wherever. And so being patient and like graceful with yourself as, as they're learning, as you're growing, as you're experimenting with a new way of being, um, that is, th that's the key. And also to ask for help. So I think it was important for me to know things could be different before I even knew to ask for help. And so then asking for help for me had its own complications because I didn't feel like I was worthy of help. I, I didn't think anybody would understand me because how could anybody know how awful my life was? And mm -hmm. the reality yeah. is, is people didn't need to have gone through the exact same situation as me. Like they just needed to be loving and kind and just in their presence is healing. So, um, so you don't have to necessarily find somebody that knows specifically what you're going through, find somebody that's loving and kind. And, and there's a lot of free resources. I, you know, I cannot stress it enough. Like um, just don't stop looking. I've heard there's like long lists at, uh, for therapy in some places, and mm -hmm. that's not the only path. Like there's sound healing. I, I always recommend going to Al-Anon or AA. Those are free. Mm -hmm. And even if you don't have alcoholism in your family, the teachings in those programs are so powerful and healing and apply to everybody's life. The and recovery so principles. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And so, and now we've got YouTube and stuff. I do worry a little bit about um, some of the messaging that's on some of the social media, just because, uh, you know, that's there's people media. throwing out things that aren't necessarily um, experienced with that. But so, so filter who you're going to follow, filter the, the information, you know, more than, you know, so trust yourself in finding people that resonate with you and um, and then just believe it's possible. And there's this, you know, a lot of, at least for me, I had to see it to believe it. And so I was waiting forever because what I realized is I had to believe it to see it. And so once I flipped that thinking around, mm -hmm. I a lot of things changed for me because I started to, you see what you're looking for. And so if I believed I could heal, if I believed I could be strong and confident and fun loving and courageous and all these fun things, mm -hmm. that's, that's what I'm going to focus my attention on. So, so for anybody out there listening, it's like what you focus on grows. And, and, and the one thing that we already touched on chase was nobody's broken. Right. You know, um, we are just human. We have these emotions, we have these experiences, and it's more about having support and tools to integrate those into our life and not let them define us, but help fuel us and propel us forward. Yeah, that's cool. Thank you, Jessica. Thank you for sharing all of that wonderful advice. Obviously, that was that touched my heart. I know that's touching the heart of the listeners. So thank you so much. Thank you. Jessica, thank you for, for kind of coming on the show and, and letting me ask you all the questions about your life and the skills and the lesson. All oh, super, super awesome interview. So I, we're running out of time here, but just really quickly, I want to know about your short show, Cracked, that's coming up yeah. soon. Um, I want to know about what shucking is and then where people can find you and what you're doing. Great. So Cracked is coming out on November 11th of 2024. Where can and people find it? They can find it on my YouTube channel, Jessica Zempel. I'm right. the only Jessica Zempel in the world. So it's pretty easy to find. And um, and it's it's meant to spark love and joy and healing. And um and so please let me know if you have questions. It's it's 20 minutes, so a lot is left unsaid. And yeah. my whole goal is to 
have Q and A's and different workshops to help people, whether they want to reconcile with a family member or they want to learn about moving from a victim mentality. And all of that will be found on my website, which is life shucker, L I F E S H U C K E R.com. And, you know, just dig into the website. There's free resources out there, how to work through judgments, um, how to set boundaries, at, like there's so much material there that is just free for anybody that wants it. And then if I also work with people one-on-one, I have workshops and retreats and all of that can be found on my website. So um, if you're inspired to do some shucking, which we talked about a little bit, but it's basically cracking that shell open that's around our pearl with love uh, so we can shine. Um, yeah, just reach out. I, I, personally respond to every email. So share whatever questions or ideas you have. And if I can't help you, I will do my best to point you in the right direction. There we go, guys. That's Jessica for you. Jessica, thank you so much for coming on my show. I really, really appreciate your time. Thank you, Chase. I I, I am so excited to meet you now that I'm uh going to be in Utah and you're right there. And um, yeah, and I really appreciate what you're doing. It's it's amazing how the world brings us together in such unique ways. I mean, the fact that you have a connection to Cracked and you're breaking stigmas and here we are together. It's great. Yay! Yeah. So for, for those watching on YouTube, for those not on YouTube, I have my whole right arm is a sleeve of a uh, tattoo sleeve of cracks, cracked but not broken. Right? It's all about mental health, but yeah, no, thank, thank you so much for your time. And yeah, I'm looking forward to having you here in Utah. Um, and again, everyone who is tuning up to this point, thank you so much for tuning in. I, I really appreciate it. I know Jessica really appreciates it. If you're Again, if you're not a part of the Wellness Center tribe at this point, obviously you need to be. Please make sure to smash that subscribe button and hit the notification button as well. If you're on Apple or Spotify, hit that follow and download button. Uh, and then, of course, please share this episode with people. There are people in the world who need to hear Jessica's message, and you guys are the way in which it's shared. So please share that. Please help us grow this tribe. Hi, uh, everyone. Um, I really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Guys, I'm always looking for guests on the show. So if you want to come on the show, just understand that no story is too big. No name is too small. If you do have a story, I want to share it all. Please contact me at chase at thewellnesscenter.life. Uh, that's chase at the wellness center dot life to, to get on the show. If you want to know more about what I'm doing on my day to day basis, please go to www.thewellnesscenter.life where we use red light therapy to recalibrate every single cell in your body one session at a time. Thank you everyone again so much for your time. We both really appreciate it. We hope you guys have a great rest of your day and we'll see you on the flip side. Peace out.